We're going to begin reading in verse 1 of chapter 3. The Bible says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the Lord, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land, and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Now that's probably one of the first Bible stories that we learn as small children other than the story of Adam and Eve and Noah and the ark. I, don't, I would hate to guess how many times I have read the, and heard the story of Moses and the burning bush, but it's still good. Let's, let's consider what's going on here. As we know, so far Moses had been born to uh, the children of Israel. He had been hidden away, but then his mother, because of the command of Pharaoh that all the baby boys of Israel should be killed, takes him down, puts him in that ark, and hides him in the bulrushes. He's found by the daughter of Pharaoh who raises him as her own. He, of course, is raised by his mother because God worked it out that his sister would be there and told Pharaoh's daughter, I know a nursemaid. You want me to go get you one? Uh -huh. and, and so she raises the son, but when he becomes of age, he goes and he lives in Pharaoh's house. And he's there until he sees that, uh, he sees that Egyptian uh, harshly treating one of his fellow Israelites, kills him and flees for his life. Now he's in this wilderness here. He's working for his father-in-law as a shepherd, a, uh, occupation that Egyptians viewed as, as lower than low. You can read about that in Genesis. They didn't have a very high opinion of shepherds. But here he is. He's 80 years old. He's working for his father-in-law. He's out on the mountain with his flock of sheep. And he comes across this burning bush that burns but is not consumed. And Moses being... I, I love that the thing that gets this whole story going is just plain old curiosity. He's just being nosy. He's like, well, that's weird. I'm going to go take a look at that. And then it sets in motion this entire uh, sequence of events that we're going to learn about through the rest of our quarterly. But not, I don't want to jump too far ahead or step on any other lessons, but... The thing that stuck out to me this week, I learned something new that I, I'm kind of ashamed I didn't know before now. But this place where Moses has this amazing experience, where he not only sees this bush burning but not consumed, but hears an audible voice of God telling him exactly what to do. This place is called Horeb. What I learned this week is that Bible scholars pretty much agree unanimously that this mountain of Horeb has another name that we know a little bit that we're more familiar with. Horeb is the same place Bible scholars seem to agree as Sinai. Horeb is the same place that after the exodus occurs and, and Moses is allowed to lead God's people out of bondage in, in Egypt, Moses is going right back when he goes to Sinai, going right back to the same place 
where he had first encountered God in this burning bush. And to me, that makes sense. Because if all of a sudden, I'm leading anywhere between 600,000 and 2 million people all of a sudden, after my last job was just watching over a bunch of sheep, and now I've got like 2 million people following me, I'm going to need some help. And if I'm Moses, I'm probably heading straight back to where I heard God the first time. I don't know about you all, but, but that's like, well, I don't really know what to do, but I know where I found him before. I'm, I'm going back there. Horeb is the place, if you read on through Exodus, and this isn't covered in our quarterly, so I'm not getting on anybody else's lesson. Horeb is the same place where God commands Moses to take that rod and to smite the rock when the children complain that they're dying of thirst. He strikes the rock and water comes forth out of the rock. That's the rock of Horeb we find in Exodus. It's the same place in Exodus chapter 19 where this thick cloud descends and the Israelites see thunder and earthquake and lightning and the sound of this trumpet that grows louder and louder and louder until the Bible says Moses speaks. And it doesn't say what he said, but if you imagine the, the ground is shaking and, and there's lightning and thunder and, and this trumpet just keeps blowing like out of nowhere, blowing louder and louder and louder. I imagine Moses would be like, oh, okay, God, what is it? Like, What are you trying to get our attention about? Okay, God, we get it. And God answers him by a voice, it says in chapter 19. Again, God speaking audibly on Mount Sinai, evidently so that everybody could hear. It's the place in chapter 24 when God is about to deliver Moses the plans for the tabernacle and for the Ark of the Covenant and for the law. It's the same place in chapter 24 where a cloud again descends on this mountain and the glory of God appears like a devouring fire. Sounds a lot like the burning bush, doesn't it? Here again in, in, uh, on Mount Sinai, God is speaking audibly. God is making Himself <coughs> seen in a way that you could not mistake it for anything else. It's a place where God shows His glory. What's interesting when you realize that Sinai and Horeb are the same place, I'm going to leave Exodus for a little bit here. When you realize that these are the same, in fact, the same exact place where all these things take, where all these things happen, the burning bush, the, the sound of the trumpet, the earthquake, the lightning, the fire, the, the cloud, all this stuff. Makes it interesting when you find yourself over in 1 Kings, chapter 19, and you read the story about how Elijah the prophet had stood up for God when Jezebel was leading the children of Israel away into the worship of that false god Baal. You, we read about how Elijah, you know, saying, how long do you halt between two opinions? We've got to make a decision here. We can't try to serve God and Baal. We've got to solve this thing once and for all. And of course he challenges those 450 prophets of Baal to that great contest that we read about and challenges them to call down fire from heaven. Of course, they are unsuccessful. And Elijah, they cry all day. All it takes for Elijah is, is one small prayer and everything is consumed by fire. And because those prophets of Baal lose the contest, Elijah kills all 450 of them, which doesn't make Jezebel too happy. So she seeks to kill Elijah. And now Elijah, after seeing this mighty work of God, after seeing fire, again, fire fall from heaven, is on the run. Doesn't know what to do. Just like Moses when he comes out of Egypt. He thought he was doing God's will. He was pretty sure he was doing God's will. I mean, God's fire came down and consumed the sacrifice, the altar, the water, everything. But now it's, it, it seemingly has all blown up in his face. He's, he's as we read in chapter 19, he... It seems like Elijah doesn't quite know what to do, so where does he go? He gets that, that food from the ravens and says he makes a 40-day journey to Horeb. <laughs> when all this stuff is going wrong, where does Elijah go? To Sinai, to Horeb, to the place he knows that God speaks 
And God gives direction. I'm going to read a little bit out of chapter 19. It said, He arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And he came hither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. Where Moses had stood. And behold, the Lord passed by. Now knowing what we know now that Horeb and Sinai are the same place, it throws new light onto what happens here. The Bible says, A great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. No doubt Elijah had been raised hearing these stories of the mighty ways that God had shown Himself on Mount Sinai, on Mount Horeb, and here comes this mighty wind that blows so hard the rocks break into pieces just the same that Moses had taken those stone tablets and thrown them down and broken them on that same mountain so many years before. But God's not in the wind. After the wind and earthquake, the same thing that happens in chapter 19 when that trumpet blows the earth, it says the earth quakes. So Elijah said, well, it might not have been in the wind, but evidently here comes an earthquake. I've heard about these God earthquakes here on Mount Sinai, but God wasn't in the earthquake either. After the earthquake, a fire was the very first way that God showed Himself on Mount Horeb was in fire. Oh, surely, if he wasn't in the wind, if he wasn't in the earthquake, here's a fire. This is the way that he made himself known to Moses so many years ago as a fire on a burning bush. But God was not in the fire. And you know this. If you've read the Bible, you know what comes next. After the fire, what? A still, small voice. Now, we use that as an analogy now as Christians who have received the Holy Spirit through Christ as an analogy of how the Holy Spirit speaks to us in a still, small voice. That's probably the best way I've ever heard it described. It's something that's indescribable. That's, you know, when God speaks to you, it's, it's not audible, but it's, it's inside. It's, it's still and small. But I, I don't think that's exactly what the writer of Kings here is is. He's not talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit hasn't come yet. Because we'll see later in 1 Kings 19, it isn't just a still small voice. Later in this same chapter, God is speaking to Elijah. God is speaking in an audible voice to Elijah. The way uh, other translations have it, some say a gentle whisper. Some they say a thin silence. Uh, the New Revised Standard Version has this, the sound of sheer silence. So what's happening here in chapter 19 of 1 Kings? There is wind that is so powerful. Can you imagine that? That it breaks rocks into pieces. Then comes an earthquake that shakes the earth to its very foundation. Then comes a fire. which It's, it's like in 19 of Exodus where it just gets more and more. There's thundering and there's lightning and there's the sound of this trumpet. And it's just building and building and building to this crescendo. But God's not in any of it in in chapter 19, and then all of a sudden, nothing. Sheer silence. Have you ever been in a situation where there's something so loud, and then all of a sudden, it shuts off? The, the silence is almost louder than the noise, it seems like. This was God's way of getting Elijah's attention. Because after that still, small voice, as I said, God begins to speak. Speak to him and lay out a plan for what he is supposed to do. He tells him he's got to go down and he's got to anoint a new king over Syria. 
He says he's got to go down and anoint a new king over Israel. He says he's got to go down and find this boy named Elisha and, and anoint him as the new prophet in his stead. And then God says, Elijah, you might think you are alone, but I've got 7,000 people in Israel who have never bowed down to Baal, who have never kissed him. You might think you're alone, Elijah, but there's a whole army behind you, and I'm going to see this thing accomplished. Both Moses and Elijah go to Horeb. They go to Sinai. They find God's presence and they hear audibly, literally, His voice. The voice of God. I find it interesting too, you read in 19, when that still small voice comes, what does Elijah do? He wraps his head in that mantle. Same thing Moses does here. He hides his face because he's in the presence of this great almighty God and the sound of His voice. He can't stand it. He his initial reaction is to just hide himself because he knows that he's unworthy to be in this great presence. There on Mount Horeb, there on Mount Sinai. In both, of the, in all of these instances, all the instances you find in Exodus, and then all the 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 story that we find here in First Kings chapter nineteen, God speaks to these men audibly because there is a work that they have to do. Sure. Each time God speaks, it's not for nothing. God is giving them specific instructions on how things are supposed to go. And He needs them to understand exactly how this thing has to happen. He speaks because He, he, he needs to make Himself understood in the clearest possible way. Whether He's telling Moses to go and speak to Pharaoh, or, or whether he's telling Elijah to go and anoint these new kings and this new prophet. They hear God speak, and they hear in exact terms exactly what they are supposed to do. Which, frankly, makes me a little bit jealous. <laughs> because how much easier would life be if you knew you could go someplace? Even if you had to catch a plane and fly 18 hours across the world, and you could, but I mean, you could get there. You could get there. You, it took Elijah 40 days to get to Horeb, but he was going there because he knew he would find God's presence and God's voice there. You could get there if you needed to. You could get to Horeb. And, and if you knew that once you got to this place, you would not only find God's presence, but you would hear His voice like somebody speaking to you, and He would tell you exactly what you needed to do. Wouldn't that be awesome if we could do, if we had that luxury? I mean, there was a situation, and I can't go into details, but there was a situation in, in my house this week where we had a decision to make. There was no right answer. There was no wrong answer. Uh, it could be a tremendous benefit. It could be disastrous. And we had to make a decision, like a split-second decision. And, and it was completely gray. There was, there was no... And you try to pray and you try to seek God's face, but it's like a decision has to be made right now. What are you going to do? And to be honest, if it was an option, I would have said, can you give me like a day I'm going to go book a last-minute flight to the Middle East and go to Mount Sinai. Because, I mean, it might cost me a pretty penny, but then I'll at least know exactly what I'm supposed to do. Live in my faith. You try to pray, you live out, you try to lay out fleeces, but sometimes it's just the way it is. Sometimes we experience what Elijah got right before God starts laying out his plan, the sound of sheer silence. Makes me jealous of Moses and Elijah. I know God's real. I know He's aware of my needs, just like He tells Moses. Here He's seen the affliction of His people. God isn't getting up in years and needs stronger glasses. He can see just as good now as He could back then. He knows my affliction. He know He hears my cry. I know that I know that God cares, but but yet sometimes it's Silence. Sometimes it's silence. Like I said, though, when God spoke, it was because He had a plan. He had something that had to be accomplished. And it had to be worked out. 
exactly the way he needed it to. Because you see, it's like a bunch of dominoes falling throughout the Old Testament. One thing knocks over another thing, and one thing turns something else this way. There is a plan that is happening throughout the Old Testament. And each of these events that occur through Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Moses going on down to Elijah all the way through are setting up what will be accomplished when we get to the New Testament. Things had to happen in a very specific way. So even though I'm jealous of Elijah and Moses for getting to hear God's audible voice and getting to receive direct instruction, I know that I've got something better than either of them did. Listen what the writer of Hebrews says. This in the opening of his great letter to, to the Hebrews. Chapter 1, verse 1 of he, uh, Hebrews says, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners, in different times and different ways, spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. There used to be earthquakes. There used to be fire. There used to be the sound of trumpets. There used to be audible voices in the Old Testament. But we've got something so much better. At different times and in different ways, God's spoken to our fathers by the prophets. But he has in these last days, meaning in this a new age has dawned. Hath in this time now that we're living in spoken unto us by His Son. John said, I was thinking of Dad talking this morning about how God came to us. God said the Word, the Word that spoke to Moses, the Word that spoke to Elijah, the Word wasn't just in heaven, it became flesh and Amen. dwelled Amen. among us. He hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. More than a disembodied voice. More than something that we have to wrap our faces in to hide our faces. We have a fully manifested, a fully visible Savior who speaks to us through His Word and lays out, even though sometimes it seems like we don't know which way to go and which way to, which way to turn, He gives us a Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us and directs our path. And, and he lays out in his wonderful word a, a way of being in the world and, and living with other people that even though it's contrary to every bit of human nature, it's the, it's the way to fix everything that has ever gone wrong with the world. A new Moses, a new Elijah for us that remember on the Mount of Transfiguration, I like this, who appears with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? It's Moses and it's Elijah. Both of those ones who sought God's face on, on Mount Horeb. Why? I think it's a sign that we heard from Moses before. We heard from Elijah before, but something new and something better has come. And he can't, though Moses died, God himself buried Moses. Though Elijah was taken up in that fiery chariot, Jesus, we find later in Hebrews, will continually make intercessions. He will always be there to, to intercede for us when we need to speak to God. It would make life easier. It surely would if we could hear God's audible voice and receive direct, direct instruction. But there's no need because the plan has already been fulfilled. On Calvary, Jesus does not say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. The plan that He was laying out Beginning here with the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. The plan that was continuing on Mount Horeb in 1 Kings chapter 19. The plan is completed. And the plan, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, all the promises that God ever made to us are made yes through Jesus. In Him they are not just yes, but they are amen. That's what Paul says. Unto the glory of God by us. We don't need a Mount Horeb. We don't need a Mount Sinai. God doesn't speak like that anymore because in these days He speaks to us by His Son. Amen. We don't need Mount Horeb. We don't need Mount Sinai because we have Mount Calvary and that's where the plan saw its completion. Thank you.